great pleasure to welcome you here today and to welcome our speakers. There are many words that you can uh, use to describe America's federally funded transportation system. Not so many in polite society, perhaps. Uh, you could say that it treats a central pillar of our nation's economy um, uh, as a vehicle for dispensing treats, what we call um, Washington pork or earmarks. You could say that in addition to bridges to nowhere, it builds roads, transit, buses, and rail without any bearing on how they connect. You could say that it drastically underserves the poor, the elderly, and anybody who either can't afford uh, or to buy a car or can't drive. You could say that it represents a third of US carbon emissions, and with the addition of other emissions, such as black carbon, is the largest US contributor by sector to near and midterm climate change. You could say all of these things and many more about a system that is now a mass of haphazard, of band-aids haphazardly applied to a creaky 60-year-old out-of-date system. And most of all, you could say that it is just about the only thing that anyone in this room has ever heard of that hasn't raised its price, which is the federal gasoline tax, in almost 20 years, while the cost of what it pays for has risen by almost 40%. If you put all that together, um, we are living in a country that seems satisfied to accept a system that operates without a plan, without ways to measure success or failure, a system that is entirely reliant on an uncertain import, and a system that cannot pay for its own maintenance, repair, or necessary additions. If you had to pick one word for all of that, I would call it declinist. I know that's a red button word, and I use it advisedly because I believe there is no other national policy that has as much to do with economic health, with national security, with energy security, and climate security, and is as mired in political inaction as this one. It is a system that is in need of radical reform, and like everything else in life, it has to be paid for. The answers are part diagnosis and part, even more, prescription. The prescription has to be economically sound. It has to be bold to match the scope of the problem. It has to be demonstrably fair and politically feasible. We are releasing today the report of an effort that attempted to meet all of those goals uh, over more than a year of intensive work by three national leaders supported by an expert staff. Former Senator Bill Bradley, a congressional leader on tax reform, former presidential candidate and a deep thinker on a range of national problems, is a Democrat, also a distinguished Carnegie trustee. Former Governor and Secretary of Homeland Security Tom Ridge, who is also an expert on energy security, is a Republican. Joining us by video from New York, former Controller General of the United States, David Walker, is one of the country's foremost experts on fiscal prudence in public budgeting, and not just now when it's the issue of the day, but for many years, is a political independent. Together, these three leaders bring the highest level of expertise on the full range of issues that has to be considered in thinking about transportation reform. They re represent all of the political spectrum, or at least all of it that believes that the federal government has a critical role to play, not just abroad, but at home, in making this country strong and successful. They have been leaders in both the state and federal government, and from both the legislative and executive perspective. And as what we consider an asset, they come from outside the transportation industry, without constituencies to serve or past positions to defend. Framing this project and overseeing its work is David Burwell, director of Carnegie's Energy and Climate Program, founder and CEO of Rails to Trails Conservancy and of STPP, the Surface Transportation Policy Project, among many other leading roles in the field. 
I want to thank the leadership team, all three, for their really important work and for a product that meets the very high bar goals uh, that it set with a series of recommendations, especially on the funding side, that are profound, that are far-reaching, that are creative, and that are politically sensible. For anyone who is serious about this country's greatness, its ability to compete, its ability to inspire respect abroad, to attract investment, to return to healthy growth, and to provide its citizens with a lifestyle that does not revolve around traffic congestion, the subject that we're here to talk about today has to be at the front of their concerns. So let me turn now to David Burwell to introduce the report and thank all of you for joining us uh, today. Thank you, Jessica. I think we're going to have a little transition here. Um, I just want to welcome you all. Thank you for coming. And uh, it's nice to see so many friends in the audience. I want to say uh, thank you also to the panel and, and, and Dave Walker, who is uh, at the UN, where he's at the, the outside auditor of the UN, which is a big job as well. So um, thank you, Dave, for joining us. Uh, I just pressed this button, right? OK, good. All right. Um, that's about as my technology <laughs> goes. Uh, anyway, thanks again. What's going to happen, I'm going to give you an overview of, th of this report. It's a big report, as you know. It's 124 pages. I expect we'll have a uh, quiz at the end of this uh, conversation. Uh, and uh, that will be about 12 minutes. Uh, we will then have short remarks by each of the, uh, our three leaders. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, I will ask one moderating question to each of them, and then we're going to open it up for question and answers from the audience. We should be uh, done by about 2.15, 2.30. That, that's OK? So. Um, the first thing I do want to say uh, uh, something about this leadership team. It has been a real honor to work with these uh, three uh, gentlemen. They have been very engaged. Uh, they are particularly uh, uh, expert in aspects of this study. Dave Walker, physical prudence, uh, and a person who's very concerned about getting uh, our budget in, in our national budget in shape. Uh, Bill Bradley, a former senator, uh, architect of the Tax Reform Act of 1986, uh, among a bunch of other things. He played a little basketball well, I, as well. Uh, and Tom Ridge, Governor Tom Ridge, Homeland Security Sec uh, Secretary, and Governor of, of Pennsylvania, and a person who's very concerned about national security and particularly energy security. Uh, it goes to show transportation and finance is not a uh, partisan issue. And these folks not only are smart, but they, they all like each other, actually. So it was a great honor to work with them. OK. Uh, Road to Recovery, this uh, report uh, has five parts uh, and uh, uh, will address each one of them. Uh, and uh, starting with the size of the deficit, of the transportation deficit, how big is it? diagnostics of how we got there, looking forward to a 21st century transportation system, the co-benefits of pricing transportation for specific outcomes, and how to do it, which is the, um, I'm sure, going to be an interesting discussion in this age. Uh, the current transportation program is insolvent. Uh, this is a chart that shows how the balances in the Highway Trust Fund uh, to date uh, it is solvent, but uh, as many of you know, it's solvent because uh, we've transferred $35 billion from general revenues over the last three years. Uh, and, uh, and as we know, that's also insolvent, so it's really borrowing money. Uh, under the new rules, if we are not going to transfer any more money uh, from the general fund to transportation, you can see the balance uh, of the trust fund goes down very dramatically, very quickly. But that's only one aspect of insolvency. We also looked at other aspects of, uh, of ways that transportation expenditures contribute 
to the national debt. Uh, the top line there is, is actual cash transfers. There's interest on the debt. There's productivity, the effect of underinvestment for, underinvestment for economic uh, return, and also the costs that other agencies have to deal with some of the externalities of transportation. Uh, HHS, you know, <coughs> health and welfare costs, air pollution, um, other costs. So uh, the big one is deferred maintenance. Uh, if you don't take care of what you've got, uh, the system deteriorates pretty fast. We have not been taking care uh, of the existing system. Three different, uh, two different commissions, uh, national commissions have looked at the question of deferred maintenance. Um, a conservative estimate is 60 billion to 85 billion dollars a year in additional costs to future generations from not maintaining the existing system. Um, uh, that uh, comes to a total deficit, uh, our contribution to, to present and future deficits of 103 to 175 billion dollars a year. Diagnostics, the second uh, chapter is about diagnostics. We thank Dave Walker for his guidance on this. We used uh, the types of inquiry that he uses uh, and the GAO uses when he was its director. We focused on Safety Lou, analyzed uh, the 150 plus programs that are in Safety Lou, including set-asides. And then we asked four questions. These are questions, you know, what was the original purpose, context of the program? Is that context and, uh, st and, and that purpose still relevant? Uh, ha or has the, has the goals been achieved? Uh, is the game still worth the candle? And are the funding schemes assigned to fund these different purposes working together or are they conflicting? That's just some of the questions we asked. We went through all of these programs. The findings of the diagnostics, and I think this is a really important part of this report, is the um, attention it, it, it gave to diagnost diagnosing the existing system. The current program is uh, achieving suboptimal goals. Uh, they, the basic issue here is that the initial program uh, intent of a lot of our transportation uh, programs was created 50 years ago when we were going to build a national highway system, an infrastructure system. And so therefore, most of the performance metrics and most of the federal oversight was on process, not on outcomes. It was how, you know, design criteria uh, uh, and um, requirements for you know, building it right, designing it right, getting it done under budget. It was not about uh, the performance of the system once built. And now that we have a built system, we need to focus on performance. Earmarks are not connected to the planning process. Uh, and also funding is unsustainable. We, by focusing on capital uh, improvements rather than lifestyle maintenance costs, we end up building a system uh, that is very uh, is underfunded in terms of its maintenance and its rehabilitation costs. This impedes private uh, investment. If private investment does not think that the, the debt service is going to be available uh, to pay back uh, their participation in the bonds they buy, they're not going to invest. The United States is unique uh, within developed countries in not funding transportation from transportation sources. 66% of the federal cost of our surface transportation program is paid through some sort of user fee. In all other uh, OECD countries, we're looking at OECD countries here, transportation actually contributes to the economy. It actually pays not only the full cost of transportation, but also part of the education cost, part of uh, uh, health and welfare costs. Uh, the result is the system is deteriorating. This is a uh, analysis done by the World Economic Forum. Uh, the United States in the last 10 years has gone from sixth in the world in terms of the quality of its infrastructure to 23rd. This is really, this hurts global competitiveness. competitiveness. Also, transportation costs, uh, projects have costs that, uh, have costs that barely uh, exceed uh, the benefits. This is a uh, chart uh, by uh, two economists from NYU. Uh, I'm going to say, I'm an, Maminus and oh, Ishak Nadiri, who's done uh, several of these, these studies. But uh, the return on investment is now approaching the cost of, co of capital. This is based on, by the way, on the microeconomic analysis. What are the costs in terms of saving travel times, wear and tear on the vehicles, and logistical improvements? But 
based on that uh, that that measure of return on investment, the pe what's the return to the people who use the system? Uh, it's approaching the cost of capital, which means it would be uh, worth <clears throat> just keeping the money in the private sector. Also, uh, there are externalized costs. Oil dependency is an externalized cost of transportation. Ninety-four percent uh, of transportation fuel uh, fuel is is petroleum based. Seventy percent of oil consumed is in the transportation sector. That does not include uh, uh, well to wheel. It includes just pump to wheel. Doesn't include even the oil used in in asphalt. Uh, the result is we import 50% uh, of uh, the oil we consume, uh, uh, and that's at a cost of $323 billion a year. The costs of oil dependence are, are um, have a direct effect on GDP. This is a chart of, uh, developed by David Green from uh, uh, Oak Ridge National Labs. Three different kinds of costs. That, uh, of this dependence. One, the green is simply the lost GDP from wealth transfers resulting from uh, markets that uh, are not liquid and that uh, uh, since suppliers are, are we're dependent on certain suppliers, uh, we're not getting the best possible price. The orange is from oil shocks. When we have oil shocks, people naturally don't buy things because of uncertainty. Uh, and the third is uh, loss of, is that, is that one? what do I do with that? Should we start? I told you. Oh, yeah, the third one is. <laughs> okay. All right, okay, thank you. This is about as sophisticated as I get. Sorry about that. Uh, is simply that as the price of oil goes up, the cost of transportation as a factor of production goes up, and that also contributes to GDP. You can see those losses are rising uh, to about 300 to 400 billion dollars a year. Looking forward, uh, we want to. The main point here of this slide is that we should focus on outcomes. Uh, not, transportation should focus on outcomes, not on process. Uh, it's not a goal in itself. Economic competitiveness, energy independence, and innovation to uh, grow the economy is uh, are three outcomes that are worth focusing on. The summary of our recommendations on how to invest these are these are you'll find not largely uh, uh, divergent from the many other studies that have going on, the National Commissions, the, the Brookings, the Ashdos, the, the, the very bipartisan policy centers, all the groups that have focused on, uh, on investment. Basically, it's uh, cut for efficient, efficiency, cut programs that are no longer needed or not, not serve a purpose. Uh, don't consolidate them, cut them. Uh, invest for growth. Uh, and price for solvency. And that's basically, uh, in a nutshell, the recommendations. Uh, obviously, there's much more detail in, in the report. Uh, direct benefit from doing this uh, is, uh, is the climate benefits. Carbon pricing are, are, are will, the uh, pricing of, of transportation carbon uh, does shift travel behavior and helps reduce uh, carbon emissions from the transportation sector, which are now 34% of total U.S. carbon emissions. This is an interesting chart. This shows uh, that the type of uh, emissions from transportation have a particular effect on climate uh, called climate forcing. The fact that uh, transportation emissions are low on sulfates, which radiate uh, 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 warmth, and also are heavy on black carbon mean that it it actually causes more climate for climate warming uh, per ton of emissions than other sources, and on road emissions are now the largest uh, uh, source of of climate change. Uh, over time, they will be overtaken by power generation, but right now, uh, transportation is the largest contributor to global warming. New revenue strategies in the short term. We propose to focus on uh, pricing of petroleum, focusing on oil upstream when uh, prices rise, and downstream gas taxes when prices are 
uh, are declining, when the world price of oil is declining. We do not propose uh, increasing the gas tax when the price of oil is going up. We propose abating it. Uh, and uh, this way, gas taxes will not be imposed unless the, the actual price at the pump is going down. In the long term, we need to transition to other forms of user-based fees. Uh, we all know about these VMT-based fees, carbon fees, tolling. Uh, there's a variety of other ways to price uh, the system to generate the revenues needed to build it and to maintain it. Our particular plan for solvency is to look upstream and downstream on the, va uh, on the value chain of oil. Uh, and the idea is when the price of oil goes up, then uh, uh, margin, the margins of refineries and the upstream producers increase. And it's appropriate uh, that they participate uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the financing and the funding of the system. Uh, they are, this system produces or consumes 70% of their product line and it's appropriate that they participate in the funding of that system. Downstream, the users at the pump should pay uh, and it keeps a floor on the price to make sure that efficiencies uh, are, are still priced into the, into the price. The way this works, and there is, uh, you have, you should have picked up, I hope you did uh, fre uh, a frequently asked questions about the funding of this, of this, uh, of this plan, a little complex, but basically you set a trigger price uh, for the imposition of an oil security tax. At this, in this chart, we picked $100 per barrel. Today, it's about $95 per barrel. Uh, at that point, imposed an ad valorem 5% oil security tax upstream of the refinery. This is exactly like, uh, in character, the oil pollution tax under the Oil Pollution uh, uh, Liability Act. It's an eight cent per barrel tax. And we use the same administrative structure to collect this ad valorem fee of 5% uh, oil security tax. As the price of oil goes above the trigger price, because it's an ad valorem price, the, pr the, the revenues increase from that tax. Therefore, we should abate the gas tax. Uh, that is the countercyclical nature of it. Keep uh, the consumer, uh, give him some, uh, the consumer some relief, uh, and still fund a transportation uh, investment program. When it comes back to the, the price of oil, it goes back to the trigger price. That that restores the status quo. The federal gas tax remains at 18 cents. However, if it goes below the trigger price, then the gas tax uh, will go up as the ad valorem revenues decline. Uh, not only is that appropriate uh, uh, as a signal uh, for efficient use of the system, but one dollar per barrel in the price of oil translates about two point five cents in the price at the pump, and that uh, so the consumer will still see a a, re, a lowering or a reduction in the price at the pump. However, gas tax revenues will increase uh, quite quickly. So that's basically uh, the proposal, both uh, cut for efficiency, invest for growth, and price for solvency. Uh, there, we need to invest in transportation in this country. There's a smart way to do it, and this is our proposal uh, to achieve those outcomes. So um, that's, that's, that's it. That's our story, and we're sticking to it. Uh, what we'd like to do now, I mean, if there's anybody really wants to say, you know, has a question for clarification that they just have to, to give, uh, we can do that. But I'd like to go directly to our three speakers, if that's okay, and then we'll have a question and answer period later. Okay, uh, we, I'd like to turn first to, to Dave Walker, because uh, first, uh, diagnostics are, are important to this report, and and, and Dave was insistent that before we ask uh, the American public for one dollar more in infrastructure, we have to make sure the program is right-sized right and we're using every dollar most efficiently. So Dave, you have uh, five minutes. Thank you, David. I appreciate it. I'm sorry I can't be with you in person, but I'm chairman of the Audit Committee of the United Nations, and I've got meetings for the next three days. Uh, thanks to Carnegie for putting this together. Bill and Tom, always good to see you and, and be with you, even if it's uh, video-wise. Today, we now see 
that the United States has $14.3 trillion in debt, uh, that debt ceiling d discussions are ongoing, and that Washington appears to be more dysfunctional every day. That's the big picture. But here we're going to talk about surface transportation. And quite frankly, our, our nation's surface transportation system is another example of how government has become dysfunctional and fiscally irresponsible. You know, in 1956, this country was much more future-focused and fiscally responsible. And it went about developing a plan to create a national security, security economically-based uh, interstate highway system, and we funded it on a pay-as-you-go basis with a gas tax uh, and creating a trust fund that really had resources uh, in it. Today, if you look, you can see that the gas tax is unchanged since 1993. The transportation needs have soared, uh, and yet our infrastructure continues to deteriorate. The U.S. government spends about $80 billion a year for transportation, of which, because of inadequate revenues, the general fund and therefore current and future taxpayers fund $25 billion a year. This gap is growing while our competitive posture is declining and our infrastructure continues to deteriorate. We must face up to our critical service transportation needs but we need to do it in a fiscally responsible and sustainable manner. Uh, as Ronald Reagan once said in so many words, we can either invest in critical infrastructure today or we can pay a much higher price later. Our current policies and fiscal path are both imprudent and unsustainable. We need to change what we fund and how we fund it. This means that we need to separate between true critical needs and unlimited wants. We need to have a strategic forward-looking plan and engage in appropriate cost-benefit analyses. And we need to have adequate revenue to meet those true needs. We need transformational reforms, not incremental reforms. And with this as a background, the Carnegie Endowment pulled together Senator Bradley, Governor Ridge, and myself to try to come up with nonpartisan options that can achieve bipartisan support. And we've tried to do that by making changes both with regard to planning and execution as well as funding. Among other things, the report recommends a permanent ban on earmarks and moving away from non-return on investment based uh, formula allocation systems. It also recommends an adequate funding source that would adopt a new oil security and price stabilization fee that David talked about that would help better grow the economy and reduce <laughs> our oil dependence. Uh, this is an assurance policy against future oil shocks, as well as making sure that we have adequate resources to invest in critical infrastructure without, and I underline, without adding to our national debt. One final comment. I got involved in this not just because this is an important endeavor in and of itself, surface transportation, not just because it was a great opportunity to work with Senator Bradley and Governor Ridge and the Carnegie uh, excellent team that was put together, but because this is illustrative of the type of fundamental review and reexamination that must be undertaken with every major government program and policy. The truth is, is government has grown too big, promised too much, and waited too long to restructure. The time is now to help create a better future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. And uh, 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 Mr. Walker will uh, stay with us for the question and answer uh, session a little bit later. Uh, I'll next turn to Senator Bradley, who's been very insistent on the investment side that we do uh, investments that serve national goals, national needs, uh, and uh, maximize our return on investment. Senator Bradley. Thanks, David. I'd like to uh, begin by thanking the Carnegie Endowment uh, for sponsoring uh, this study on a very crucial issue. Uh, in particular, I'd like to pay tribute to David and Shinpei Tei, who uh, worked uh, around the clock in some cases to 
make this all come out the right way. And Jessica Matthews, of course, who has led this effort and had a longstanding interest in the environment and energy and transportation. It was a real pleasure to participate with Governor Ridge and with David Walker. Uh, we had some very interesting discussions slash negotiations, uh, but we did reach a conclusion on a very large contentious issue important to America's future. Uh, some of you might say, well, why um, is the Carnegie Endowment for Peace doing this? Aren't they only interested in uh, foreign policy and uh, international affairs? And I would say, yes, uh, they're interested, the Carnegie Endowment for Peace is interested in America's global place in the world, no question about that. And the state of our infrastructure actually affects our place in the world, uh, particularly as it relates to the economy. People think about transportation as building bridges to nowhere. But I think what uh, we determined and assert today is that there's a more fiscally responsible and greener solution and better solution available to transportation policy. Each of us uh, talks about a different aspect of this before we get to your questions. David just finished talking about the fiscal aspect and um, reform of the fiscal process. And Governor Ridge, Tom is gonna to talk about energy security. Uh, and I wanna talk about um, the economy and economic growth and competitiveness and how central transportation is to uh, the development of the highest possible economic growth. Whether it's productivity or growth, transportation is essential. And we begin by saying public investment in transportation is a public good. And the reason is a public good because an economy cannot function unless raw materials can move from where they're harvested or mined to the place that uses them. An economy cannot uh, run unless the goods that are produced are able to get to the people who want to buy them. And an economy cannot run in a world economy unless the goods that are produced get to the export markets that want them. And I would argue that an economy can't run unless uh, people can get to work, unless uh, people can move from one place to another in an efficient, time-sensitive manner. Uh, today, the government spends uh, $70 billion on all modes of transportation, $52 billion on surface transportation. And the, the fact is that we're not getting uh, enough bang for our buck. And uh, what is wrong, everyone in this room can uh, tell your story. Um, I, uh, when I lived in New Jersey, uh, my house was 13 miles from New York. I commuted every day. If I left at 6.15 in the morning, it took me 50 minutes to get there. If I left at seven, it took me an hour and a half to two hours to get there. Not a great use of time. Uh, mag multiply that towards millions of people who maybe like their radio in the morning in the car, but who nonetheless uh, are not giving the kind of work needed to move American economy forward because they're stuck in their car in the beltway or wherever. Uh, think of uh, taking that train, as I'm going to do later, from uh, D.C. to Boston. It's an embarrassment how long it takes how uh, rough it is. It's an embarrassment to a country as great as ours. Now, just compare that to the trip from Tokyo to Osaka, or from Paris to Nice, or from Beijing to Shanghai. We're in a competitive world economy, and we have, uh, it's a we're in a competitive world economy for the 21st century and we have early 20th century transportation system in this country. We simply won't be as effective and grow as much if we don't have uh, effective transportation systems in this country. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, I think that developing a list of projects of national significance are important. Instead of funding, you know, the mayor's project on the corner, because that'll help in your reelection, there ought to be a register of nationally significant 
uh, 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 transportation projects. And let me give you a specific uh, example of why that would be useful. When the financial crisis occurred in 2008 and we needed a large stimulus, we weren't alone. Every country in the world needed a large stimulus. Uh, our stimulus was, uh, well, we need to spend money on infrastructure. We'd have to be shovel ready, which means who, what do we do? We call the local mayor or the governor who's got a few projects that he wants and that's what we funded. The Chinese didn't do that. The Chinese had a list of nationally significant infrastructure projects for the next five years. And they simply moved year three and two up to year one. So that every dollar was spent in that stimulus package went to improving the economic competitiveness of that country. That is what we need in this country. And we need that for our road system, we need that for our rail system, and quite frankly, although it's outside the scope of this uh, study, we need it for our air system and for our waterways. So I look forward to your questions, and I hope that you can clearly see why this is important to our long-term economic competitiveness. Thank you, Senator. And uh, finally, but not least, of course, uh, Governor Ridge, Tom Ridge, uh, former governor of Pennsylvania and and promoter of some very attractive rail trails in Pennsylvania that uh, we funded. Um, investments, by the way. They are very good for tourism. Uh, and Homeland Security Secretary, he's also uh, serves as, if I understand it, the chair of the Energy Task Force for the Chamber of Commerce. Thank hey, you, David. Uh, let me echo the, the comments of my colleagues, uh, David Walker and Senator Bradley, in public recognition of you, David, and Chinpei. You've done absolutely marvelous job. I, a couple of thoughts my colleague shared with you. One, David Walker talked about uh, this, this model, this analytical model, and I'd like to think the solutions that we proffer are not a bad paradigm for uh, uh, governors and or our national leaders to look at individual segments of their budgets in order to bring them into uh, the 21st century compliance with the need to balance uh, their budgets but also be much more strategic in their thinking as how they expend public dollars and to the extent that uh, my colleague uh, Bill Bradley talked about uh, our negotiation and discussion I recall the first conversation I had with Bill I see he talked to me about uh, we we're gonna have David Walker and you and me and I said well that's nice he said I said to him you know from time to time you pull together a coalition sometimes the favorite color of a coalition is plaid and and, and, and Senator Bradley said no plaid we will reach consensus some way or another and we've done that uh, through some great discussions and uh, uh, we're very, I'm very proud to be associated uh, with the endowment and these individuals in this report. How many of you, uh, if you had a, uh, in your mind, the number of the press conferences you attended, articles you have read, TV programs you have viewed that talked about America's dependence on foreign oil and what we're going to do about it to change things? Uh, I would suggest that the list is probably uh, rather lengthy. And I suspect many of you have, uh, if you went through that same Rolodex of experiences, how many times have you been participating in a forum like this or read an article or watched a TV program talking about the need to build uh, transportation infrastructure, 21st century transportation infrastructure, to meet our strategic long-term needs in a competitive marketplace that's global. We are interconnected. America's security and its economy depends on how well we relate to the rest of the world, and we're going to do something in the 21st century different than we've ever done it before. And at the end of the day, I think all of us realize that our national security and our economy and our prosperity are interlinked. You really can't be secure to provide for the common defense and to uh, resist all threats, foreign and domestic, unless you have a strong economy. And you can't have a strong economy unless your uh, national security oper uh, operation is in place and robust and uh, uh, contemporary. So at the end of the day, uh, the three of us felt and the endowment felt that the national security interests of America are very much linked 
to our economic competitiveness. And as Senator Bradley has highlighted, probably nothing more important today in the 21st century to be competitive is our transportation infrastructure. And in this extent, we have focused in on, uh, on, on, on surface transportation. We all know that it's uh, not self-sustaining. The figures are, uh, uh, are evident as well as they are embarrassing. I think most people, when they pull up to the pump, figure, well, I just paid X percent for gas. Gas tax probably goes up every year, uh, and I'm paying for the roads, when in fact we're only paying for about two-thirds of the, the rebar, the concrete, and the asphalt we put down. We're borrowing the rest, and that's not a sustainable model if you're going to bring a... Uh, uh, a 21st century approach where you accept you have a national security interest in balancing the budget and you have a national security interest in building a stronger transportation network. Now there's a lot of things that we could say about uh, national security as it relates to uh, the transportation system. Uh, foremost I guess is our competitiveness. You can't possibly be competitive and therefore you can't be secure nationally if, you are, if your infrastructure is deteriorating. Ours is deteriorating. As Senator Bradley, sometimes it takes me uh, almost an hour to go seven miles into DC. I just drove in from my home in, uh, in what, up in Penn, Northwestern Pennsylvania. There were seven construction sites along the way. Uh, constant maintenance, refurbishing. Uh, guess what? Delays. Because of that, uh, uh, that, that, that construction and the delays and the cost associated with failing to maintain and repair on an ongoing basis, huge cost to the American consumer and a huge cost to, uh, uh, frankly, to, uh, to our economy. Um, what are we going to do about it? Well, we have the capacity to do something about it if we're willing to make this a priority in the United States. We're willing to relieve, uh, uh, to, to, to remind ourselves that, uh, uh, that the oil cartel that often impacts what we pay at the pump has an impact on our competitiveness and therefore on our national security. Can you imagine when a bunch of countries get together? Remember, we get 50% of our oil from overseas. 50% of the oil we consume comes from overseas, much of which from unstable regimes. The question becomes, how much longer do we want to rely on those regimes. There's a lot of things we could do. Obviously, there's a lot of controversy and continued debate. Should we drill or not drill in the United States? That's for another, another conversation. But more fuel efficient cars, clearly. Alternative fuels, clearly. But also, how about a sound 21st century transportation policy that recognizes that it is in our national security interest to make sure that we don't have these horrible price fluctuations at the gas pump? Remember, when those prices goes up, that's disposable income out of the pocket of consumers, less to buy, less to generate, more economic activity within our economy, the economy gets weaker. There is an impact. We're seeing part of that impact now during the course of the debate here on the deficit reduction going on in this, in this city right now. So at the end of the day, in order to make energy security a reality, I think we absolutely must make it a priority. Uh, and frankly, uh, I, we would urge, I join my colleagues, uh, David Walker and Senator Bradley, and uh, in urging public officials and industry leaders uh, to accept the rather bold and innovative ideas provided in this report. Bring stability to prices, build infrastructure based on national need, enhancing at the same time our national security because we've made ourselves more competitive, our consumers don't have the whipsaw of fluctuating prices due to oil shock, and we finally figured out a way to deal with a, a fiscally sound, a greener, and far better infrastructure system. Thank you. Thank you, Governor Ridge. Um, I'll now take uh, the moderator's prerogative to ask an initial question to each of our uh, speakers and then open it to the audience, starting with uh, David Walker. Uh, Mr. Walker, uh, the transportation program is the biggest public works program in the United States, but it's still only one part of a relatively uh, uh, small discretionary uh, budget in the United States. Why should we focus on transportation spending in the context of the overall deficit reduction debate? Well, as I mentioned before, David, I think that we clearly have a number of challenges dealing with surface transportation. We have a deteriorating infrastructure. 
Uh, we're, we don't have a 21st century transportation system. Uh, we are borrowing from current and future generations and funding, uh, fund, uh, funding it uh, through general revenues, which was never anticipated. Uh, and so as a result, in addition to the issue of trying to deal with the legitimate challenges facing surface transportation, the environment, energy, national security, et cetera, this is an example of the type of review uh, and reengineering that needs to take place throughout many areas of government at all levels. Uh, you know, the, the truth is, is the U.S. government is largely based upon conditions that existed in the United States and in the world in the 1950s. And Senator Bradley made an excellent point to say that rather than having a more strategic, forward-looking, uh, and, and prioritized list of nationally significant projects, uh, which is what most other industrialized nations and developing and emerging nations have, we are working on the fly, uh, which is totally inadequate. So uh, it's important in and of itself and it's important to demonstrate what needs to be done in other areas of discretionary spending, mandatory spending, and quite frankly, don't forget, we lose $1.1 to $1.2 trillion a year in revenues through tax deductions, exemptions, and exclusions, and they're backdoor spending, and they need to be on the table, too, and subject to the same type of analysis. Thank you. Uh, Senator Bradley, you were uh, served uh, for a long time in the U.S. Senate and uh, n well know the, the popularity of the earmark program. Uh, do you really think that a ban on earmarks is uh, possible uh, in terms of a, a long-term investment strategy and, and uh, what are some of the other ideas you might have about how to do investment better? Well, I think that we cannot afford not to eliminate the earmarks. Uh, I understand the argument um, that's made. I understand the reform that has taken place already. But to my mind, uh, we've reached a critical point in our democracy. There is a time in our democracy, or in the life of a democracy, where the narrow interests so dominate the process that it cannot function for the general interest. In other words, the interests of all the people cannot be served as long as the first priority is dealing with the issues of some of the people. And I think that that's where we are today. I think that's what the earmark represents. And therefore, I think as a first step to getting a hold of this deep problem in our democracy, uh, eliminating earmarks are important. But let me just give you one more example. <clears throat> when I was in the Senate, <laughs> I was visited by uh, a company that was not an American company uh, that had um, a form of pavement that would last 40 years. But because it would uh, not require roads to be repaired every five years, it was prohibited from being used in this country. Now, in my time in the Senate, I didn't see a better example, and I was on the tax committee, so I saw a lot of examples. <laughs> I didn't see a better example of the narrow interest being served to the detriment of the general interest. It, Governor Ridge talked about driving down from the Poconos today in Northwest Pennsylvania. He had four construction projects. My guess is if this other kind of pavement was there, he probably wouldn't have any. And he'd have been here quicker. And I think that this is, we've, we've gone past the time where we can afford the continued dominance of the legislative process by the narrow interest. And earmarks are one small example of that. Thank you. And um, the easiest question uh, uh, for Governor Rich is, uh, this report proposes a counter-cyclical oil fee and gas tax. Uh, is such a proposal actually possible in an anti-tax environment? And, and secondly, you know, what, what would the en energy industry think of this idea? Well, 
certainly uh, the endowment and my distinguished colleagues think if we are to be serious about addressing uh, the issues relating to the deficit and competitiveness and uh, energy security and uh, all the associated environmental benefits, then one would think this would be uh, warmly and immediately embraced by both sides of the aisle. Uh, however, I think we know that uh, at the present time, uh, uh, it may not be, but I would like to think that maybe 218 in one body and 51 in the other would be enough. But look, the bottom line is, is that uh, the present road is not only falling apart, but is unsustainable. You can't possibly maintain, for example, in Pennsylvania, we had about 100,000 miles of roads and probably as many bridges in, as in New England. And just the maintenance itself of those roads. Obviously, we had uh, some state taxes and there were some federal dollars involved. But it's an enormous sum of money. When they're not maintained properly, there's an economic cost associated with those uh, truckers who are driving across and those automobile users. There's a huge cost for poorly maintained roads borne by the consumer, borne by industry. We also know that there are places, and we've identified some in the report, where there are programs of national significance that unlock potential of regions, putting more people to work, enhancing the economy, improving GDP. Well, you can't build more capacity and you can't enhance the existing capacity and improve it with less money. That is truly the new math and it won't work. <laughs> so at the end of the day, responsible leadership says, I would like to think they would at least give serious consideration to the fairly balanced approach that we have suggested in the report. Provides stability of pricing. Price goes up, consumer pays less. Price goes down, consumer pays a little bit more in taxes, but there's a stable platform and you have an identifiable, sustainable, predictable source of income and you begin doing all of these things. So I guess at the end of the day, the answer is it's a tough call. Uh, but a lot of people want to go to heaven. Nobody wants to die to get there. You've all heard that expression. But at the end of the day, if you're looking at an energy issue, the national security of our energy dependence, you're looking at the need in the 21st century to build more and to maintain better, you need additional dollars to do that. And unless you're willing to accept the notion, you're going to need additional revenue. Not borrowing to build, pay as you go. And I think that's a case that can be made by the right people and would, who are willing not to demagogue the issue, but are willing to stand up in front of the American public and most of whom are driving and have one, two, or three cars in the driveway who would truly appreciate the 21st century approach toward enhancing and improving their national infrastructure. It will take some leadership and more leadership and uh, less uh, demagoguery. Might get it done. David, can I mention one thing real quickly? Sure. Right. Yeah. Uh, I live in Connecticut, and I regularly move back and forth between Washington and Connecticut, and I occasionally use another form of surface transportation, which is called Amtrak. Uh, and Amtrak has something called the Acela, which is our fastest train in this country. And let me just tell you, I have on more than one occasion been between New York City in Stamford, Connecticut, and literally, I could run faster <laughs> than the train was going. Now, I'm fairly fast, but I'm not that fast. And so that, that's just another example of how antiquated we are. Now, we can't afford high-speed rail everywhere in this country. It doesn't make economic sense. But there are parts of this country where it is absolutely outrageous that we don't already have it right now. Uh, which, because I know we've talked about roads, I think we also have to talk about rail as well. Thank you, David. Um, I think you can see why it was such a pleasure working with these folks who don't have strong opinions. Uh, uh, and uh, I'd like to, while we have uh, lots of hands, I just want to recognize uh, Shinpei Tsai, who was the director of this project and, and kept this uh, team together, the leadership and a bunch of consultants. Yeah, appreciate it. Tough questions. In the back there, man with the uh, 
Thank you, uh, Irv Chapman. I work for Bloomberg Radio. Would you comment, please, on some of the proposals that are out there at the moment, such as the infrastructure bank, which would presumably uh, build on a $200 million federal initial investment, uh, the prospect of selling turnpikes uh, and bringing in private investment in the manner that the governor of Indiana has done, and the suggestion by the chairman of the House Transportation Committee uh, that uh, spending be limited to the gas tax and uh, no more federal dollars. Uh, could Senator Bradley and uh, Governor Ridge, from your political experience, comment on those proposals? Um, well, I'm sure we each have our own opinion about specifics of uh, the things you've mentioned. But what we're here today to do is to talk about this report and what it means to the country. So I want to kind of avoid specific individual questions because none of us have a vote. And the only people that are important here are people who have a vote. Um, I would like to just uh, take your question, though, to take it a little bit back to the issue of the day, if you ask the American people, which is jobs. And when you think of infrastructure, you think of jobs created, people working on the side of the road, laying asphalt, and building a road or a bridge. But what you have to do for the 21st century of think about what that infrastructure unlocks in the creation of many times more jobs than those who actually worked in the infrastructure, building the road. Uh, one of the issues of national significance that we uh, mentioned in the report is in Seattle, Washington, South Park Bridge that moves into the port area. Just the rebuilding of that bridge would open up hundreds of millions of dollars of economic activity in the Seattle port. That's the kind of thinking that we have to have. We have to think of long term. And we should know that, if, uh, that there, there is another country that is thinking long term. And of course, that country is China. I mean, right now, it is building high-speed rail lines from uh, Beijing south to Singapore, uh, from Beijing across Central Asia to the Black Sea, and the northern route across to Berlin and to uh, Paris. Now, why are they building those, that high-speed rail in those three areas? It'll be so much easier to get raw materials. It'll be so much easier to move products to new markets. It is, not, it is a far-sighted decision, and we cannot afford not to take those kind of decisions uh, today. Thank you. Uh, Tanya? Um, Tanya Snyder, Street Blog. Um, excuse me. Oh, thanks. Just please wait for the, uh, for the microphone. Sorry. Yes. Tanya Snyder with Street's Blog. Um, if I understand your proposal, the... Um, the gas tax would go down if the price of oil goes up. If predictions are correct, the price of oil is going to continue to go up as scarcity, uh, along with scarcity. How does that help uh, stabilize revenues for infrastructure? Do you want me to take that? Uh, as the price of oil goes up, the oil security fee uh, revenues go up as well. Now, it is true that the way we've structured it, uh, with uh, in this example, uh, the price, uh, the gas tax would be abated one cent for every three cents uh, that the uh, for every three dollars increase in the price of oil. That will result in a net uh, loss of about seven hundred million dollars because the oil security fee uh, generates less. However, you've started with a, f a five percent ad valorem fee in initially, which generates at the trigger price, about $28.5 billion. So you start with a $28.5 billion addition in revenues. Once the gas tax is abated entirely, at whatever level, the oil security, if it keeps on going up, the oil security fee will generate additional revenue, and the net revenue will keep on going. But in no case uh, will the revenue be less, uh, and it will always be significantly more than the present uh, initial uh, uh, return from the, just the gas tax. On the downside, um, you can generate a, a tremendous amount of revenue and still have the price of gasoline going down. So that's a, a different question. But it happens on both sides. 
Wait, you in third row? Third row? Uh, thank you, P uh, Peter Whitney. I teach at the uh, Intermodal Transportation Institute uh, out in Denver. I've been doing that for 10 years. Um, and I've learned a lot from my students. So, and I, I thank you for your report. And I'm sure there are, and I know, hear a lot of good ideas. But I wanted to ask you how much you considered the private sector in putting together the diagnostics and the rest of the report. This is what some of the things that I've learned from my students. These are uh, young men and women in their late 30s, early 40s, mid-level executives in FedEx and other planes, uh, barges, uh, trucks, transportation, and these incredible logistics companies. And for the last 30 years, I, I, we have the statistics, trade has grown two or three times the, the rate of the GDP, and yet we've been able to handle that trade. And despite the low government funding, and these are some of the things that I've learned from them in, in, in improvements in supply chain management. The large forwarders have made incredible improvements. Uh, the logistics providers, in working with governments to, to remove impediments to trade. The investment in, in private infrastructure has really been significant. M many billions of dollars the railroads have put into double tracking, uh, inland container load centers and other equipment. And all the ports and the private terminal operators have really increased their investment and worked with the government. I mean, I, I use the Savannah port for a business I have. I'm going to be there shortly. They have made incredible improvements. And it's now stimulating Charleston to to compete. So my question, my basic question is how much did you consider, I mean, how much is the private sector in your statistics or not? Because a lot has been done and we wouldn't have been able to handle this trade uh, with, with, without it. And uh, although uh, Senator Bradley did mention this might be t technically off the topic, you do talk about oil dependency a lot. I mean, the, the um, uh, uh, head of the Carnegie Institute, and you all have mentioned it several times. Well, what are we doing about the TransCanada 2008 uh, uh, application to send oil down from um, Alberta to Port Arthur, Texas? We have refineries that could use it. There'd be a lot of jobs, both in construction and, and add-on jobs. It's nearly three years. There have been two State Department reports and all okay. this stuff. Finish the question. <laughs> That's the question. The private sector. How much have you considered? Okay. Would somebody? Like, I mean, I have some views. Uh, would somebody like to respond yeah, well, to that? Well, first of all, I think uh, the the focus of the report, uh, I think, almost implicitly realizes what the private sector has done. I mean, obviously, we accept that as a given. It's uh, uh, and we're really focused on what the federal government, what government should be doing, perhaps in support of. Uh, the uh, billions of dollars of investment. I think we're all familiar with what the private sector has done, but I think government has a role to play. And that's why the focus has been on uh, a national strategy for programs of uh, national significance that would supplement and frankly take, uh, you, your productivity is up because of those investments. And I believe, I'm not gonna speak for David or, or Senator Bradley, but we think the productivity would be up even higher if uh, the infrastructure rec improvements and enhancements uh, that we believe for which the government is responsible for directing uh, would be made. There are, I think we, we found 50 or 60 federal highway programs. We found almost like 80% of the decisions are made not with an eye toward national impact, that broader uh, multiplier effect. Uh, you build it and they will come. They're just done in a lot of in instances by the state and local decision making. Uh, we think, uh, we could take even greater advantage of the improvements bought and paid for by the private sector if we had a, a more robust and comprehensive and national strategy around transportation infrastructure. Okay, right here in the front. Thank you. I'm Mike Quigley from White and Case. Two very brief questions. You've eloquently framed the question, and a lot of it seems to revolve around the uh, America's infatuation with the automobile particularly large, uh, powerful automobiles. I, I noticed a nice looking automobile right in front of the Carnegie Endowment here with Pennsylvania plates. I myself have a, a, a large yeah, it's mine, car. I'm not apologizing for nope. it. <laughs> I don't apologize for mine. So my question is, has your report addressed some means to convince America that driving something other than a large, powerful automobile 
uh, is in the nation's interest. Second question is, Senator Bradley particularly has focused on China, and indeed all four of the BRICS countries, Moscow and Delhi and, and Brazil, all um, have as a top tier policy item improving their transportation infrastructure. Regrettably, we do not. I hope your report changes that dialogue here, but I see how a distinguished Democrat and an distinguished Republican and an independent have come together to produce a, a, worthy, uh, a worthy piece of advice. How do we get whatever tea you all uh, were consuming uh, up to Capitol Hill so that the political barrier to us having transportation infrastructure as a top tier item uh, is surmounted? Thank you. I just think the more examples of uh, people of opposite parties getting together and solving a problem demonstrates to elected officials that the problem can be solved and gives them a roadmap, roadmap when, and I think it is an issue, when they choose to do it. Uh, that's what we're really doing here. We're not voting or passing a law. We're demonstrating that there is a consensus position on this issue that's fiscally responsible and that has the long-term economic interests of the country at heart and also it recognizes the energy security is uh, a key aspect of our need. Um, so I think just by example, I think that's the best way to lead often, just by the power of example. Now, this is just one report. Uh, two years ago, I sat in a room with uh, Jack Danforth and Bob Packwood, two Republicans, Gary Hart and me, a Democrat. The challenge was balance the budget by 2020, we did. Now, this is not rocket science. People of good intention can sit in a room of different parties and get a solution to practically any problem we face in the country. And uh, we're not there now. So all we can do is to show in this area that it can be done and there can be a policy. And it's up to you to take it from there. Got about I might, five can I jump in? Let me just David. add one. I think the Senator is spot on. You know, we certainly have the capacity to do these things. Uh, what you're looking for is how do we get the political will to do them? And I think one of the great disappointments that a lot of us have, even in this present uh, uh, debate with regard to the deficit, and this is very much a part of that debate, a critical part, but not at all is that there have been legitimate bipartisan attempts over the past two or three years to lay a foundation more broadly for this country to follow. Uh, the president had a commission, Congress, there was an independent, there have been several commissions out there where people work long and hard, people with enormous political credibility, both sides of the aisle. And to date, at least as part of the public discussion, all their work and all their work product has been basically ignored. At some point in time, maybe the accountability comes at the ballot box. Uh, but uh, you go back to that, uh, I mean, I was privileged to serve the early 80s when Ronald Reagan asked Tip O'Neill to help solve Social Security. I know everybody refers back to that, but, you know, on these tough controversial issues, uh, you really end up getting the kind of resolution that I think the country uh, needs and looks for if it is bipartisan. I mean, I think that's what we are trying to project with the, uh, uh, the threesome here. It can be done. The capacity is there. Uh, with well, the energy companies, they've got a little heartburn because it's an ad valorem tax. But, you know, they're consumers, too. They use our roads as well. Uh, and the retail customer who's, one, experienced the, the impact of these oil shocks over the past 20 or 30 years just hasn't been done. The past eight presidents have talked about energy security and energy independence. Nobody's done a bloody thing. And at some point in time, somebody just has to say, well, maybe we can find a bipartisan consensus and start uh, uh, chipping away at the deficit. And one great place uh, to begin that process, and I think David Walker said it beautifully, this is not a bad model. This is not a bad paradigm. Uh, and we're just hoping for our point of view that somebody just focuses on transportation and uh, looks seriously at some of these recommendations. David, if I can, let me jump in for a minute. First, I want to reinforce something Senator Bradley said. This is leading by example. You have to start someplace. We're looking for nonpartisan solutions.
that can achieve broad-based bipartisan support. And let me remind you that one of the reasons that we have a Democrat, a Republican, and Independent is because in more and more states, including my state of Connecticut, a plurality of voters are political independents. And so it's not just Democrats and Republicans. It's Democrats, Republicans, and independents. And then one other thing I would say. One of the most frustrating things to me when I was Comptroller of the United States or Auditor General and Head of J.O. was the fact that the United States has been in existence since 1789 as a republic. And yet we've never had and still do not have a forward-looking threat, risk, opportunity, and resource-constrained uh, uh, strategic framework that is outcome-based to help us be able to make decisions on how are we going to end up allocating limited resources to maximize impact. And this is just one good faith effort to try to start that in one area that hopefully uh, can end up growing to many others. We have time for maybe two more questions. I know Governor Ridge might have to leave, but um, is there a woman in the audience with a question? I mean, I know it's a, this is a male-dominated sector, but uh, uh, we'd like to you know, be equal here. Yeah. Okay, we're going to go. You, sir, then. Uh, Alan Wendt, uh, increasing the gasoline tax is such an obvious and necessary thing to do. How do we make that happen politically? Is it possible, uh, let's say, uh, five cents a year, introduce the tax very gradually over time so that after a certain number of years it would begin to have a real impact in terms of providing funds for improvement of the transportation sector? Is, is anybody even thought to this politically in the Congress? Well, I'll, I'll answer that just for this report. Obviously, we gave a lot of thought to it and felt that Taxing gas on the way down is the way to get consumer support for it, not when it's going up. Because adding a gas tax when the price of oil is going through the roof uh, is not the most politically acceptable way to do it. So we've, we've tailored this precisely to uh, add a gas tax at, at a time when consumers can absorb that cost. If anybody else would like David, to. can I jump in for a sec? Sure. First, I think we have to recognize the political reality that the idea that you're going to end up uh, ha getting bipartisan agreement for increasing revenues before the 2012 election is highly unlikely. However, I believe that there is bipartisan recognition that after the 2012 election that we need to start making tough choices in a range of areas. And that includes taking a more strategic, forward-looking, and outcome-based approach to this and other areas, and that, as Senator Bradley knows well, that we're going to need another round of comprehensive tax reform that will make it simpler, fairer, more competitive, more equitable, and generate more revenues than historically has been the case. Uh, this is one piece of a much bigger puzzle, but I believe it's imperative that that be done, and I believe it can be done. Uh, but not before the 2012 election. Last question. Okay, in the middle of the room there. The middle of the room needs to be represented. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Marshall Nannis from the CSIS Energy Program. Um, a central part of this report has been the issue of a gas tax, a user fee for people driving on the roads. Have you looked at all at uh, user fees for people in other service modes of transportation, rail and transit? Uh, should these people be paying more in uh, fares and user fees to get a better, more robust system, or should they be paying less to make these alternatives more attractive? Uh, are they paying about the right amount? What's your view on these types of user fees for uh, going beyond just road and uh, car transportation? Uh, the uh, Just a quick answer to that, so people might want to expand on it, but the this uh, report said, uh, looked at a lot of different revenues uh, proposals, but said in the short term, uh, taxing uh, and pricing petroleum at all levels of the value chain is the best way to generate solvency in the transportation sector. Uh, and in the long term, these other types, you know, uh, user fees, transit, rail, uh, parking management, variety of other issues have a, a great role to play. Uh, but in the short term uh, and at the federal level, <laughs> Uh, to generate revenues for a federal program, pricing 
uh, fuels uh, is is the focus right now. A lot of those th uh, those fees would stay at the state and local level, which are needed. Uh, let me just uh, follow on one quick point, uh, a little bit on the gasoline tax question, but it also has a wider uh, implication. Um, whenever you deal with public policy, you say gasoline tax. Should it go up or should it go down? You know, and you're saying gasoline tax. But there are other areas of public policy that interact with that, that change the circumstance dramatically. Let's say, for example, that you were able to double the mileage or more of uh, the fleets. Uh, if you had a gasoline tax that was 10 cents a year for 10 years, which is a dollar, and you doubled the fleets average so that we're a little ahead of where Europe is today, in 10 years, uh, the average person would be paying no more for his fuel or her, free, her fuel because of the added miles per gallon that they got. And you'd never hear that story. It's always one, this stovepipe and that stovepipe. But public policy is a dynamic uh, process and it's organic and it relates and if you don't if you can't make the connections, then you're forever stuck with the binary views, you know, this or that on a narrow issue when it's really just one stroke in a big painting. And if I might add to that, I think the report also looks and talks briefly about more fuel efficient cars, alternative fuel. I mean, if you had the infrastructure for natural gas, the equivalent uh, energy might be a buck fifty or a dollar seventy five a gallon. Um, but we, I mean, we really see that since 94, almost 95% of the fuel used in transportation generally is oil. Uh, that's the, uh, the reason we're focusing on this. But hopefully, if there's vision and this policy evolves 10 years, however long it takes, you'll have a mixture of uh, some of the other uh, added uh, enhancements to the transportation infrastructure that will lead to a, a cheaper uh, more in, more efficient and, uh, frankly, environmentally friendly uh, outcome. Thank you. And uh, just in closing, um, several of the questions uh, address the question of how to invest more efficiently. And I do want to point out that this report does strongly support uh, the creation of an independent infrastructure bank to not only uh, invest more wisely and achieve uh, the, the growth in, that we need in order to finance the system. So. The infrastructure bank is a is a is a, a central recommendation of this uh, report. So, with that, uh, thank you very much for coming. And uh, I know uh, Governor Ridgeme might have to leave, but uh, maybe everybody does. But uh, thank you for coming, and uh, we'll be glad to work with you in the future.